Hi, this is Yuri. In this video, I'm going to speak about a syntax element of Haskell, which gives a huge expressing power to the language, but could be strange at the first sight if our eyes are trained on imperative languages. I hope I can give you the feeling of how syntax and semantics are bound together in a programming language. First of all, I think it is good to define what do we mean on syntax and semantics of a language. Syntax is a set of rules which defines all the possible character sequences that can be written in a given programming language to get a program which is correct structurally. And semantics is a set of rules which gives the meaning of the program elements. So we have two things, a form, what we use to express ourselves, and the thing, what we want to be said. If we are familiar with the imperative programming languages and the syntax of function calls, we know that usually we are using parentheses when we call a function which has parameters. Sometimes we put empty parentheses to indicate the fact of the call. C is a good example. In C, we are using opening and closing parentheses to indicate the beginning and the end of the parameter list. We could write, for example, f, a, b. In this case, f has two parameters. We know that because they are enclosed in parentheses. But there are other extreme approaches, like what we could see in Bash. We can write this. In Bash, as we can see, the opening square bracket is a program that we could use to test, for example, the existence and type of a file, and its last parameter must be the closing square bracket. Strange, isn't it? So in Bash, parentheses are not used in this case. And another, maybe easier example, is the echo command. Okay, I would like to give you an important note. When I am speaking about function parameters, I am using parameters in a plural form, because of our function could have multiple parameters. This seems to be normal, but in Haskell it is not really true, or at least depends on our viewpoint. The syntax, which doesn't use parentheses, could have huge benefits when we are entering to the world of currying. While I am speaking, I am writing some error news code to show how it looks like in Haskell. Basically, it's really easy to write error news code in Haskell, and it is good, because we know that they contain errors, since the compiler informs us about it. This is one of the advantages of the strongly typed programming languages. However, it is almost guaranteed that at the beginning we will not feel the feeling of success. I would like to encourage you to make mistakes intentionally and read the error messages of the compiler. It is a good way to learn and at the same time to test the behavior of the compiler in your development environment. We all make mistakes, but usually those are not intentional. Learning from simple situations would help us to read error messages in a complex environment. As you can see here, I have problem with the parentheses, and the message is somehow related to the type system of Haskell, and the compiler has problem with the number of arguments. Okay. Strange that I could fix it in this way. But why? Here, parentheses are not syntax elements which indicate the beginning and the end of the actual parameter list, but tuples. It is true for the empty tuple, what we write as empty parentheses. A little bit more confusing at the first sight, that the types and type values and type and data constructors are in different namespaces, so we could reuse their names as we wish. I will show it to you in a minute. So these parentheses indicate a type, a special one which has only one type value, the empty tuple, called the unit. It is a good example of why it is a good idea to define the type signature of a function, especially when we are learning. It could have drawbacks later, because in this way we could lose a bit from the genericity of our code. But for now, it is definitely worth to use to help the compiler to help us and to express our intentions. Later, when we have familiarized with the type signatures, we could have a guess about what a function does. The problem now is really simple. If we have a parameter, we have to mention it, or at least indicate it, in its definition. Here, normally, I could write underscore or x instead of the empty tuple to indicate that the formal parameter which will get the actual is named as x. But in Haskell, because of the pattern matching mechanism and the knowledge that the unit type has only one type value, the empty tuple unit, 
I could write just the unit itself. Yes, it's a little bit confusing. Please play with the spaces. It is not necessary to have a Haskell installation. An online compiler also could work. So yes, we could use parentheses in this situation, but it's usually unnecessary. So again, now this function has only one parameter, which cannot be other than the unit. Let's replace the unit type with a type which has more than one type values or data constructors. For example, int. Pass 3, here we could remove the parentheses. I do this transformation. If I would like to pass an int, I have to express it in the type signature. As we can see, we have to pass it. Now we know that in Haskell the parameter list of a function are not enclosed in parentheses. Think about bash. It arises a question how the compiler knows how many parameters a function have. One answer is that a function always has only one parameter, or at least this is one of the important viewpoints. But play with this idea. Does one parameter really enough? Yes. It is enough. If you are confused, this is totally normal. I am saying this because the compiler sometimes also speaks about first and second arguments. For example here, if you remember. It is the word of currying where you will get the explanation to these seemingly inconsistent things. But now I will give you a totally different approach, which is not related to the partial function application at all, but maybe helps you to widen your sight and definitely could be a huge help or ingredient when you try to understand monads. Let's imagine that you have a function called f, which calculates something, and to do so it gets two parameters, a and b. If we could see it with Haskell eyes, we could read this expression as a function which gets a tuple, a pair of values. If you have a product type, for example a structure or record, you always could write this as fs, where s is a structure which contains all the previous formal parameters in its fields. This is basically a tuple. And in this form, we can write the empty tuple as an empty structure. This is a structure which doesn't contain any information. We could call it as a unit. So if you could pass only one parameter and you could use composite types, the problem is solved. This is true for multiple return values also. You could return a structure. If you ask the question why is it useful, you have made the first step toward the understanding of the algebraic data types. But now I will show it to you in C. Okay, so in this directory we have two files. The source file, what you can see on the left side, and the really simple make file. I can run it by typing the make command. But to automate the build and run process, I wrote a simple command which will call make when I am saving the source file. This is what I am going to use now. So my saves changes will trigger the compilation. Ok, currently f takes two parameters. Let's try to replace it with one. This struct contains a and b, the former formal parameters. This is what I will use. Now I am constructing something interesting. They are living in different namespaces. Just like the unit type and the unit, what I mentioned in Haskell. Ok, let's use it. Of course, we have to rewrite the call of the function. As I mentioned, we could transform it to something like a tuple.
where A gets 1 and B gets 2. Do not worry about the warnings, I will eliminate them later. I just wanted to show you this expressing syntax. Try to return the same struct. If we would like to do this, we have to extend our word. Of course, the semicolon. I have never forgotten it in Haskell. Okay, now we have to eliminate the global variable and the side effect. Now it is a part of the word of the function. Based on this line, I will substitute it with this increment g function. And now we only have to use what we have. The parameters which are initialized the values that we used before. And the composition. The only thing what we always have to keep in our mind is to think of the whole world. And remember, if our viewpoint is changing, the whole world will change also. I hope you could take something from this video. If you enjoyed, please see the next one also. Thank you for your time. Goodbye.